morning or good afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. This is lesson 7.6. Give me one second. Here it is. All right, this is the second in the set of word problem lessons. So we've already done some, and this time we are going to focus exclusively on word problems that have percentages in them. So the first thing we're going to do, oh, and as always, I forgot to show you who this is. This is Miss Fleming. And I need to adjust things just a bit here, so give me a second. There's the pen out. And now I've got the PC where I can reach it. All right, so before we get into word problems with percentages in them, we are going to review how we can convert a percentage into a decimal. All right, that seems pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and make sure the pen is activated. And right here, convert each percentage to its decimal equivalent. There's essentially two ways you can do this. One of the ways is to just go ahead and turn this into a pen so it actually works. There we go. I didn't intend I'd read, but there we go. We're going to divide this by 100. And if you do 79% divided by 100, you are going to get 0.79. All right, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, and many of you have done, learned it this way, is to move that decimal point over two places. So it starts here, and I go one, two. So my new decimal point is here. What do I do right here? I put a zero. So 1.5% becomes 0.015. We've got the decimal equivalent of both of those. Okay, same thing here. If you want to divide by 100, that's fine. Or you can say right here, there is a percentage point right here because this is 125.00. So I can move this forward two decimal places. And the new decimal place is there, so this becomes, they are actually equal to, so let's forget that. 1.25. So we've converted for 125% to 1.25. All right, this one again, you can always divide it by 100, or you can move this decimal point forward two places. One, two, backfill any spaces you need to with zeros, and 0.07% becomes point. Zero, 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 seven. A very, very small number. Okay, so now that we've recalled or reviewed how to do that, now we can get into how to use percentages in exponential functions. So let's clear this out. And scroll this. All right, here's the concepts. So far, we have not talked too much about rates of change with exponential functions. And there are rates of change in exponential functions. They just don't actually show up in the equation. Your equation, you remember, has got y is equal to a times b to the x. And we said that b is the multiplier in general form. When we generalize, we call it a multiplier. But if my b is greater than 1, then it is a growth factor. If my b is between 0 and 1, then it's a decay factor. So at no point in this equation do I have anything that tells me directly what the rate of change is, but I can find the rate of change. And the other big part to remember is that linear functions had an average rate of change. 
the rate that is in an exponential function varies. It is not an average rate of change or a constant rate of change. It is not constant. It varies. And if you think about that, we're talking about percentages for these rates of change. They can be fractions as well, but we're going to talk about percentages. So if I had 100 of something, and let's say I took 10% out of it, Okay, I'd be left with 100, 10% of 100 is 10. So if I took away 10%, I'd have 90 left. Okay, if it was a constant rate of change, I'd take 10 out again, and I'd have 80. I'd take 10 out of again, I would have 70. But this is a percentage rate of change. So if I take 10% out again, I'm not going to take 10 out of here because 10% of 90 is 9. So I take that out and I don't have 80, I have 81. And if I took 10% again, I'd take 8.1 out and I'm not going to go through all that math. But you get my point. I always have this rate, but it varies every time when I find out what the percentage actually is. So that's the difference. All right, so we have a growth rate and we have a decay rate, just like we had a growth factor and a decay factor. And this is how I find my B if I have a percentage or a fraction as a rate. I take that rate that is a percentage and I convert it into a decimal. And if it is a growth rate to get the B value, I'm going to say 1 plus that rate. And that's going to give me a percentage that will give me the total amount plus the increase because it's growth. On the other hand, if I am decreasing by a percentage, then to get my growth, or excuse me, my decay factor, my B, it's going to be 1 minus that percentage as a decimal. And the results are going to be the total amount less the decrease. And this will become clearer and clearer as we go through the example. Erase this and scroll down, and we've got our first example. We're going to compare two different cases, and one is a percentage with growth, and one is a percentage with decay. All right, so we start out, and we have a deposit, so you deposit $1,000 in an account earning 7% compounded annually. So the word annually means we do it once a year. And we're going to get into compounding for other periods in just a minute. But this is compounded once a year, and that means once a year I add 7% interest to my, whatever my deposit or my balance is at that time. All right, so I've got the amount of my balance and time in years is right here. So T is time of years, A is the amount of my balance, here's my initial deposit, and here's where I've got to take into account what I'm going to do to get my B value. So I've got 1 plus this 7 as a percentage. Remember we took that and we put some zeros in front of it. That's where we got the point C. Yeah, right here. One, two. So that's how we point zero seven. Sorry, made a big mess there. All right, so this is my A value. This is going to be my B value. Now, you can use it just like this. You don't necessarily have to do the math. But we're going to see what it is in a minute. What is the balance of your account after five years? So T is years, so we know where that's going. Let's break this down. The growth rate is 7%, which is a decimal, is 0 0.07, or 7%. My initial value A is 1,000. My growth factor B is 1 plus 0 0.07, so my B is 0 0.07, or 1.07. And it is a growth balance, so by adding that one in the front, look what we did, we made it legal. 
for it, in order for it to be a growth factor, it had to be greater than one, and that's what we did. We made it greater than one. That also, after if I put five years in there, it's not going to tell me how much interest I was paid. It's going to tell me the total amount in the account after five years. All right, let's compare that over here. This time we've got decay. So we've still got the $1,000, but this time we're going to put it into a stock that is losing 0.3% per year. Okay, so that, if I put two zeros and move that over twice, I put the zeros at it, now I've got my decimals. So I've got the stock investment, and T is time and years again. So the value of the stock is equal to 1,000 times 1 minus 0.03 raised to the t power. This is decay, so I'm going to minus this time because I've got to make sure my value for b is going to be less than 1, and it will never be negative. Remember, it can't be 1, 0, or any negative number. Same question, what is your stock worth after 5 years? So if I were going to run this through, I'd put a 5 there to find the amount. All right, my decay rate is 0.3%. And I converted that into a decimal, that is 0 0.003. My initial value of my investment is right there, it's still that 1,000. And my B is 1 minus 0 0.003. And if I run that through my calculator, it says that my B is going to be 0.99. You can use it like this, you can use it like this, but you have to understand where everything came from. That's the biggest challenge, is going to be understanding that this B came from a percentage rate. It is not it's a percentage rate itself. But I am in decay, I am losing money, it's decreasing, and by subtracting this amount from 1, I end up with a B value that is between 0 and 1, and that makes it illegal. Okay, so let's practice a little bit with those. And you're welcome to use your calculator to do this. I'm not going to pull mine up for this. I'm going to pull it up later for some other things, but... For each growth or decay rate, so these are rates because they're the percentages. They are not factors, they're not multipliers. We're going to find the growth or decay factor, which is the multiplier. So we are increasing by 15%. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that 15% into a decimal, and then I'm going to add 1 to it. And always put the 1 in the front, especially if it's a 1 minus, or else you're going to end up with a negative number. So I'm going to convert that to a decimal. I'm going to move this forward. One, two spaces. So it's one plus point one five. And, oh, wait a minute, we are decreasing. I did that wrong. I'm glad I looked at that again. This is decay. I'm going to subtract that. One minus. So 1 minus 0.15 is going to be equal to a multiplier that is 0.85. And that's what would go in my equation. Thought I caught that. Okay, this one's going to increase. Great. All right, so this one is increasing. This one's going to be 1 plus. And again, I've got to convert this to a decimal. So I'm going to move that forward, and two places, and put a zero there. So that becomes 0 0.025, and this is going to be equal to 1.025. And since this is increasing, and if my B value has to be greater than 1, now it's legal. It is greater than 1. This one's also increasing by 43%. So this one's going to be 1 plus. The decimal's right here. I'm going to move it forward 
one, two places. And I'm going to add 0.43. So this is equal to 1.43. And that's the multiplier that would go in my equation. It's increasing, so it's growth, and it's greater than 1. This one's decreasing, so this one's going to be 1 minus. Don't do minus 1 at the end or you'll end up with a negative number, and that's not legal. You've got to put these 1's in the front. So it's either 1 plus or 1 minus. Okay, my percentage is right there. If you want to divide these by 100, you can do that. It works just fine. I'm just used to doing this. So I'm going to put that there, and it gives me two zeros here. So this is a really tiny number, 0 0.00011. And if I subtract that from 1, it's going to give me 0 0.99987. All right, so now you know how to go from a rate that is expressed as a percentage and convert it into a growth or decay factor to give you a multiplier for your equation. Now we're going to do it the other way around. We're going to do it backwards. So this time I've got a multiplier, and I'm going to say whether it is growth or decay, and then I'm going to back it out and find the percentage rate that I started out at. So we're going to do this, but we're going to do it backwards. So 0.23. Okay, that is not greater than 1. That is between 0 and 1. I'm not going to write that for every one of them, but I want you to see. So because it's between 0 and 1, it is decay. All right, now, how am I going to find the percentage that was used for that? Well, how I found this to begin with is I subtracted a percentage from it. So I'm going to do the exact thing. All I've got to do is subtract one, this from 1, and I'm going to get the percentage I started at. So I've got, I'm going to put it up here. Normally I put it down here, but I want you to see that. Okay, so this time I've got 1 minus 0.23, and that's going to give me a decimal of 0.77. Okay, how do I know the percentage for that? Well, voila, I can, if I went forward to get decimal, I can go back to, to get the percentage. So this is 77%. I started with a rate of change for decay that was 77%, and that end gave me for my equation a multiplier of 0.23. Okay, moving on. This time I've got a multiplier that is 1.35. And it's greater than 1, so we know it's growth. All right, well, how did I get this? I added a 1 to it, right? So all I've got to do is subtract a 1 from this. So 1.35 minus 1 going to give me 0.35, and then I'm going to move that decimal back one, two places, and what I started out with was 35%. I know, it's confusing. We're going to do another one. In fact, we're going to do two more. All right, this time I've got 0 0.07. Well, that's really tiny. It's way less than one. And it is between 0 and 1, so I know that this is decay. And I want to find the percentage that I'm decaying at that gave me that rate. So I'm going to subtract it from 1. 1 minus 0 0.07. And that is going to give me the, the decimal that I started with, which was 0.93. And if I go back here, I can convert that back into a percentage of 93%. So I'm decaying at a rate of 93%. My equation would get, need a multiplier of 0 0.07.
All right, I'm over one. You see the pattern? These are all over one. These are all less than one. So this is growth. And I got this multiplier by adding one to a percentage. So all I've got to do is subtract the one out. So 1.86 minus one is going to give me my percentage, 0.86. Well, my decimal. Let's go ahead and convert it into a percentage by moving this backwards this time. And that's 86%. So in other words, I am increasing or growing at a rate of 86%. So my multiplier is 1.86 because it's got to be greater than 1. All right, let's take a look at some word problems. I promise you, it gets less and less confusing. All right, example three and four are word problems, and then we're going to look at an interest rate problem. In 1985, there were 285 cell phone users in a small town of Centerville. I have no idea where it is, but I've just got 285 cell phones. The number of subscribers increased by 54% each year thereafter. How many cell users were there in 1995? Okay, well, we've got variables to define, we've got an initial value to find, we've got a rate that we actually already know, and we're going to turn that rate into a multiplier and then write an equation. So, let's go ahead and see what question we have to answer. How many cell users were there in 1994? So one of my variables, and it's going to be y, it's not going to be x, because I can tell already that one of my variables has to be about time. So I'm going to say that I should let y equal the number of cell phone users. And that's an answer to my question. And variables should always answer the question. And I'm going to say x is going to be something to do with years. Let's look at it again. Okay, it in, in 1985, and the number of subscribers increased by 54% each year. Each year. So we are, x is going to be the number of years. And it's very specific what it's going to be. 1985 is when we started, and we had 285 cell phone users. That's clearly going to be my initial value, so 285. And the year was 1995. If I put this together as an ordered pair, I could do that, but that's sure a long way from any kind of y-intercept I want. And my y-intercept has got to have a zero there. So we're going to say that 1985 is year zero. And that way we know that this y-intercept is zero comma 285. Don't get all crazy about this. It just is going to make sense now. So now when we get down here, this number of years is going to be the number of years since 1985, because that was year zero. And that's going to help us figure something else out later on. All right, so we are increasing by 54%. So our growth rate is 54%. And if I convert that into a decimal, move that over two decimal places, I'm going to have a decimal of 0.54, and that lets me build a multiplier. It's growth. We're increasing. So I've got 1 plus 0.54, which gives me a multiplier of 1.54. And if I use that multiplier, it will tell me 
the total number of cell phone users I have at the end of 1994 or whatever year I want to look for, which is a whole lot better than all it would tell me is how many I increased by each year. And that's another reason why I want this. This gives me the total plus the amount that we increase by. So my equation, and this is a general equation, so don't put anything weird in it to try to figure anything out yet. All we want is a general equation. My y-intercept is 285, or my initial value. My multiplier is 1.54. And I put in what year it is, and I get out the number of cell phone users. All right, so if two, 1985 was year zero, what year am I going to put in to get 1994? Well, I'm not going to put in 1994. I'm going to put in how many years that was from 1995. So how would I find that out? Well, all I've got to do is subtract it. So if I take 1994 minus 1995, that's going to give me 90, or 1985, I'm sorry. That's going to say nine years have gone past. So that's what's going to go in here. So I'm going to put in y is equal to, and this is where I answer my question, And if I run that through my calculator, that is going to tell me that I am going to have a decimal. And that's okay, because I'm going to tell you how to deal with that too. That gives me a y that is equal to 13,884. Point for cell phone users. All right, so this is how we deal with this. I don't have 0.54 people. That's a little bit more than half of one person. So I can't just have, you know, somebody's legs or somebody from the waist up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to round this. I'm going to get rid of this. And 0.5 says I'm going to round up. So my final answer is going to be that I have... 13,885 cell phone users in 1994. And these are my units. That answers my question. Always answer your, put the units on there. Go ahead, that's an ugly, really, really ugly user. Okay. All right, let's clear this. And let's go ahead and scroll this up. Great. I'm dropping things. Sorry about that. All right, example four. So we just did an increase, so obviously this is going to be a decay example. We just did growth, let's do decay. I have Barbara here, and she bought a car. It is depreciating by 11% each year. That is not unusual. Cars don't do anything but depreciate. Worst investment you can make. After just one year, it is worth 2800 or excuse me, $28,480. Wow, let me twist that around my time. How much was it worth when she bought it? Okay, this is a year later, right? So what I don't know is what it was worth when she bought it. And I'm going to make a little tiny table here. It's going to help me figure that out. Because if I can do it straight, always a challenge. All right, a little table, one more time. Oh, geez, that's still really terrible. All right, so be it. I've got an X, and I've got a Y, and we'll worry about that in a minute. 
And I do not know how much I paid for it, which would be near zero, the y-intercept. I do know that one year later, I had $28,480 in value. And I know that it's depreciating by 11% each year. Okay, so that's the rate right now. That's 11%. Okay, or if I move that forward two places, that gives me a decimal of 0.11. Don't know the initial value, leave it blank. Let's come back to these. If I know that's zero and that's one, and that's one year later, I'm thinking that my X is number of years, and I'm going to go with that. And if you're not writing lets on these, I think you're probably okay. I'm not sure what the online system wants you to do. But this is going to be the number of years. And how much is it worth is going to answer the question. So it's going to be y is equal to the value or the worth, whatever you want to use. And the units for this is dollars. So you can write the word in dollars or you can put a dollar sign. And the online system probably gives you some, some um, choices for what you can use. But that's what the units are is dollars. All right, so my initial value still is unknown. Let's go ahead and figure out where our multiplier is, and then we can do something with our table. I can't do anything with this with my table, but if I have a multiplier, I can do something with it. So I'm going to do 1 minus, because it's decay, 0.11, and that's going to give me a multiplier of 0.89. All right. So now I can come over here, and if I divide this by 0.89, because I divide backwards, so if I divide this by 0.89, which your fancy calculator will do for you, that will give me a y-intercept of $32,000. Oh, look, now I have an initial value. Now I've got everything I need to write this equation, and I know what my variables are, and I can do everything I want to. The world is at my feet. Y is equal to 32,000 times 0.89, and that is what gives me a B value for decay that is less than 1, and it also is going to give me the total value of the car after the depreciation of 11%. And that's going to have an X in it. And we already answered the question. Oh, it didn't even ask me how much it's worth now. All right. Answer the question using the correct units. We already did that. It was worth $32,000. So I could plug a year into this and get any value I wanted going forward. All right. Now, this is the tricky part. This is where we're going to break the calculator. How long will it be before the car is worth less than half its value? All right, so half its value, half of this, half of 32,000 divided by 2, half of it would be 16,000. You're like, okay, well, that's not a year. That's a value. So I could take that, and I could put it here in my equation as a y. And I need to solve that for x. Okay, well, we got sort of a problem with that. Because order of operations, or even by reverse order operations, um, I could divide this by 32,000 on both sides, which would leave me with 0.9 or 0.89 to the x. But I really don't have the skills to be able to solve this at this point. And guess what? You won't until you get to algebra 2. But, aha! I have a really expensive calculator, and I know this is a y value. So all I have to do is put my nice equation into my calculator at y equal, and go to the table, and then look for the x value 
that is going to tell me when it's less than half of $16,000. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to walk you through it because you have to do this quite a bit. Okay, let's get the calculator out. All right, so we're at y equal, and I want to put in $32,000. And my, let's see, it's 0.89. That's my multiplier. And there's my x. Let's get out of there. All right, let's go look at our table. All right. It looks like it landed right on it. Let's look at the table a little bit up here. Okay, if we look up here and explore a little bit, there's my initial value was 32,000. There's after that first year. So I'm looking for an X value, which would be the year in which my value dropped below $16,000, which was half the price. So if I keep coming down here, in year five, it was 17869 and in year six, it was 15903 So the answer to my question, that is less than $16,000, it's going to be six years. All right, let's get rid of this because we're going to bring it back up in a minute. And interesting. There it is, all back again. All right, so the question said, how long will it be before the car is worth less than half the value? And we found that when x was equal to 6, so the answer is 6 years. Bear with me a little bit longer. We're almost done. We're going to go to compound interest. Let's go ahead and clear this. All right, here is another one of those boxes where we have diagrammed the whole equation. In this case, it's a formula. This is a formula. This isn't any special equation. It just happens to be a formula that's done with exponential in a format of exponential function. This is a formula for finding compound interest. So this is a situation. Let's say that you went to the bank and you put $1,000 in. And they're going to give you an interest rate for your $1,000. And the time that it compounds is how often they're going to pay you interest. If it compounds annually, they're going to pay it once a year. If it compounds quarterly, they're going to pay it four times a year. If it compounds daily, they're going to pay it 365 times a year. So the number of times it compounds, the better. You want them to do it really frequently. But they're not that generous. They're not going to pay you the same interest rate. They get an annual interest rate and they break it down for how many periods you get compounded by. So that's what this formula is going to take care of. So this A stands for amount or total amount. This is the balance of your account after the interest has been paid. So how much money do I have after all the interest has been paid? Okay, the P right here is the principal. That's how much you initially deposited. It's your starting amount. So that would be the $1,000 in my example. Okay, so they're paying interest, so it's growing. It's guaranteed to grow. That's how banks work. So here's my one plus part where I get a multiplier that's a growth factor. Here's my interest rate. That's going to be a percentage, and I'm going to convert it into a decimal. And then I've got to do some things here. We'll get to that. Okay, this is time in years because we started out compounding annually, and we're going to change that based on how often we're compounding. So, so far, the only thing we haven't explained is the N, and that's the only thing that's really new, just the N part. And the N is the number of compoundings a year. So, if I compound it annually, N is 1. Nothing changes. R divided by 1 is still R. N, if it was still 1, would be 1 times T, so it would still be T. If I compounded monthly, then I'm going to put 12 here, and 12 there, those both places. 
because it says I'm going to compound more frequently by my interest rate is going to be divided by the number of periods I compound. If it's daily, it's going to be 365. And there's some other periods, and you're going to have to figure out some of them yourself. All right, now, this is where we get the rational exponent piece that comes in. We did rational exponents, what, I think the last lesson? All right, time of years. If it's one year, nothing changes. It's one. If time is going to be every six months, so we have to, we're going to do something here. We have 12 months in a year. If it's every six months, then instead of a full year, we would have half a year here. And you can put it in this way as a rational exponent, or you can put it in this way. It doesn't matter. On the other hand, if I had 15 months, which is more than 12, so 15 divided by 12, I could put it in like this for 15 months, or I could put it in as the decimal. Don't get too worried about this. This comes up a little bit. This is the focus primarily for this lesson. <clears throat> All right, let's put this formula to work. In the first one, I put together everything for you. Okay. And this is the last example. Whoopee. All right, we're going to look at the same amount of money twice. You invest $1,000 in an account that pays 8% interest compounded annually. Annually is once a year. Let's write that down. So that's once a year. And here's my formula. There's the, my amount. There's my principal, which was $1,000. T is time in years, and it's going to grow. My interest rate was 8%, so here's where I convert that into a multiplier. 1 plus that 8% is a decimal, and T represents the number of years. I said that. Compounded annually means the interest is added to your account at the end of each year. It's not an end at first. You have to let your money sit there in the bank for a year before they give it to you. All right, so what do we do to this same equation if we compound interest quarterly? Okay, well... That is four times a year. And we're going to add the interest every three months instead of just once a year. So the changes we have to make, this is the N in the, the formula that we had. So N gets put here. N gets put here. And my new function or my new formula now has the amount after T years is this principal investment, how much I put in initially, and there's still my 8% interest, there's still my 1 so that I am getting a multiplier that is growth. There's quarterly there and there, and there's still my T that's number of years. There are four quarters in a year, just so you remember that. All right, find the balance in your account after three years if compounded annually. So we're going to do it with this formula, and then we're going to do it with this formula. And we're going to put it in the calculator. So um, pull up your, I'm going to have to, yeah, no, I'm okay. So you guys can see this while you punch it out on your phone. I've got to make sure I can see it while I change the screen. But I can because I have it on paper. Okay, so I'm going to bring up the calculator, and we're going to do both of these. We're going to pull it off here to the side. Hopefully. Oh, it's a juggling act sometimes. Well, I was hoping it would let me move it. Maybe it won't. There we go. All right, let's put it over there because we want to be able to see the equations. All right. 
So the first one, we're going to use the first equation for compounded um, annually. And the only reason I want to see this is I want to make sure that you understand you can type these in all as one piece. So let's clear this out. And I'm going to put in 1,000 times 1 plus 0 0.08. Close that, and of course I can't put a T in. That's going to be my X. Okay? And we're looking for, after three years, um, I probably should have done this on the home screen, but I can go look for three years in the table. So I'm going to go look for three years in the table. We'll do the other one on the home screen. Uh, let's look at the table. So after three years, I'm going to have something that I did wrong. That's always interesting. Let's go back and see what I did wrong. Oh, I put in 100 instead of 1000. That would explain it. That makes perfect sense. Okay, I don't want to re-erase that whole thing, so here's a calculator trick. I can do second insert, and I can put in that extra zero. That should make a world of difference. Oh, there we go. Okay, three years, I'm going to have $1,259.70. So let's go ahead and write that down. Find the balance after three years. And it was this one right here. So my balance after three years is, this is money, $1,259.70. And okay, now we're going to compound it quarterly. So we're going to put this equation in. So I'm going to show you, you can put the whole thing in exactly the way it looks. And it's just not a problem. It works just fine. So let's switch back to the calculator again. Let's not let the pen roll away again. All right, let's go back here. We're going to clear this out. And this time I'm actually going to put $1,000 in. And I've still got this part the same. And I'm going to go ahead and put in that 0 .08 divided by 4 as a fraction. So we go to alpha y equal and select number one so we can put in a stacked fraction and it is 0 0.08 divided by 4 let's get out of here so we can close our parentheses and then I've got to raise it to a power of 4x so I put it in exactly the way I wrote it out All right, now I'm going to do three years, and there it is right now because I typed in everything correctly this time. So after three years, and since it's compounding quarterly, the more compounding periods there are, the higher the interest is going to be. It's going to, it's going to grow, at a, or not the higher the interest, the higher the balance is going to be because it's going to grow at a faster rate. So you want it to compound as often as possible. And the truth is most built bank accounts compound um, at least daily. In fact, some of them compound continuously. All right, so I'm over here and I'm looking at, right, three years, which is right there. So find the balance of your account after three years compounded quarterly, and that is going to be $1,268.00. And 20 cents. So it's a massive amount different. It's uh, about $9, but that could really add up over time. And if this was happening 365 days a year, it would be substantially different. And all you've got to do is multiply. Let's look at that. If it was happening 365 days a year, 
then this would be 365 and that would be 365. Those are the changes you would make. So it's really easy. All right, so that is the end of this lesson, and it's always a pleasure. Have a good day.